I'm cutting in with my voice uh, because I'm not allowed of uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I can't get on the chat.
right now uh, because of a technical reason YouTube won't let me go on the chat because I'm looking at it through another program so I just want to make a comment to you guys who are listening I'm reading you the chat and about the Novus Auto Mass and what I was about to um, put on the on the um, chat stream was that um, I care more about the reverence of a mass than anything else and I have no objection to a reverend Novus Ordo Mass. Of course, there's more possibility for irreverence and all kinds of abuses um, in the Novus Ordo Mass because it's less strictly regimented, so to speak. And I think that the prayers in the traditional Latin Mass are objectively stronger and theologically more on target. On the other hand, uh, if a Novus Ordo Mass is done reverently, I am often grateful to be able to follow the words of the priest as he says them. So that was my answer to that chat, and I did I didn't want to ignore the question because because um, I like the fact that you guys are are online and are chatting and everything. And I'm sorry that I'm not able to type in. Some days, YouTube seems to allow me to do it, and others. It doesn't. So anyway, I'll go back to the music now for the next few minutes. And the show starts, of course, at about whatever it says on the screen, about eight minutes. Thank you. 
Accordion Records. Hi. Great. Um, I'm real happy to be here. I'm happy to see so many of you already here. I know that we had the pleasure of a little bit of a back and forth before the show started, which is really uh, great for me too, because it makes me feel like I'm just not talking into a computer, but actually the real people who you get to know after week after week. So thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for, for being such a beautiful community. And um, let me just uh, kind of undistract myself a little bit there. Okay. Now, uh, oh, about the music. Yeah, uh, some of you commented on liking the music. I'll try to put up a link uh, to where I got the music. I downloaded it uh, for free. I, I think it's a public domain. It was recorded long before copyright would be an issue, 1908, I think, to 1928. So I'll try to put up a link below so you can get the music if you like it and of course the music is very consistent with charlie rich since uh he was born in 1899 so uh and he was born in eastern europe in a little hasidic village in um uh it's actually now uh south of poland but at the time it was hungary i believe so anyway so i guess i'll just start there um or maybe I won't start there. I'll, I'll start by not exactly apologizing for the show, but explaining why I'm doing a show on Charlie Rich. And um, many people think he's a saint, and there are some people who are trying to promote a cause for him, but he certainly hasn't been canonized. Um, but he certainly lived a very intense life of union with Christ and had an absolutely amazing uh, conversion and had the support of very reputable um, Catholic theologians and scholars and priors of contemplative monasteries and so forth who totally bought into his union with Christ. So I think he's a pretty good, pretty good model. But there's another reason I want to use him is because of this whole issue of grace building on nature. Because in fact, it's incredibly beautiful that we are all totally unique in the eyes of God. And when God makes us into saints, or when we allow God to uh, transform us towards sanctity, 
He does not violate our nature, but he makes use of our nature. And so Charlie being the kind of um, Lower East Side, blunt, in-your-face um, Jewish immigrant type, um, one could think of a lot of appropriate jokes and illustrations and so forth, uh, he carried that into a sanctity. He carried that into a sanctity, which was really, really, really beautiful. And uh, you'll see that as I go through readings of his. And as I go through this series of saints and spiritualities, it's important to remember that God builds on our individual natures and he doesn't violate them. So, you know, we're not going to become Carthusian priors or monks, probably. Um, we're not going to become militant soldiers for Christ, like St. Ignatius of Loyola and so forth. One of the beautiful things about going through these saints is to see how, well, to see where they're the same, which is they understand the meaning of life on earth is only reflected in, in its implications for eternal life, but um, how different they are also. They're allowed to keep their natures. Um, and in fact, their natures are God-given and become part of their sanctity. So anyway, that's a good reason to, to do it. I'm also going to, before I begin with Charlie Rich, um, maybe this is actually about Charlie Rich anyway, but yesterday I had a traumatic experience, which was my 40th uh, Harvard Business School reunion. Shows how old I was, but it was 40 years ago. The um, class from Harvard Business School with, you know, with which I got my MBA, got my master's degree. And it was a Zoom reunion because of the uh, pandemic. And it was a very strange experience. So I'm actually talking about Charlie Rich, although it doesn't sound like it right now, um, because I became very aware that the biggest difference between people is whether they take God seriously and have God in their lives or God is a total fiction to them. And I found that I really can't relate to people who think God is a fiction and live their lives with no relationship to God. And Charlie Rich is a Hasidic Jew. And the Hasidic Jews I know, and the um, Jews I was friends with at Harvard Business School, they have God in their lives. <laughs> they just don't have as much access to God as we have. And they don't have as much knowledge about God as we have. But they're trying to live for God. And that is, in fact, the story of Charlie Rich. The story of Charlie Rich is that he only cared about living for God. And when he couldn't find God, so to speak, he was literally suicidal and tried to kill himself a few times. And then when he found God again through the Catholic Church, um, he couldn't care about anything else. So in a nutshell, that's the story of Charlie Rich. Um, and it became very apparent to me when I was trying to relate to uh, my classmates from Harvard Business School. And ugh, I'm sorry. I mean, let's pray for them and everything, um, of course. But it's like a desert. It's like being in a desert. I don't know how to put it, but trying to relate to them sort of felt like being in a waterless desert. Okay, to Charlie Rich. Um, let me show some ch pictures. Now, most of the pictures I have of him are from uh, when he was a Catholic contemplative. But I just, you know, want you to get a kind of mental image of him. So here's a very good, very uh, revealing picture of him. You, you see him in his kind of good humor, warm hearted, uh, in this case, elderly Jewish man. And uh, again, you see the same nature of him in, in this picture uh, taken on, on the street of New York. Um, I just want to give you a little, a little um, you know, kind of visual impression of him. He was born in 1899 in a uh, small village in, in Hungary, a very uh, shtetl, I think is the word. But anyway, a, a Jewish village. Um, which was overwhelmingly, uh, perhaps uniquely Jewish. In fact, uh, as far as I could tell, the nearest big town to his village was uh, Dukla. Uh, being a big town, meaning it had about 3,000 inhabitants, 80% uh, of which were, of whom were Jews. 
And uh, so anyway, his village was obviously a tiny village in the forest, a very devout family, particularly his mother was very pious. I have a picture of her. I actually have a picture of his parents, so let me uh, bring this up. This is obviously a later picture of his parents after they moved to New York. I'll get there. But there's a picture of his parents. Now, his mother um, had a favorite um, ditty or song that... Um, that she used to, um, you know, sing to little Charlie. And I want to give you the words to it because it, it shows her piety. God is always just in his judgments. One must never say that he has any sort of ill will towards us. God knows what he does, and he never chastises without good reason, because God in his judgments is always just. It's easier for us to think this way than it was for a Jew in a village in Eastern Europe uh, 100 years ago or 120 years ago when there would be pogroms and slaughters and so forth. But the heart of piety is understanding that, um, that God is sovereign, <laughs> that God is there, and that God is all-powerful, and that God is all-good. Otherwise, you might have a kind of Islamic piety if you don't get that last part of the equation in there. Um, and I'm going to start my first digression a little early on this show, uh, along those lines. You know, we've made allusion on this show in the past to perhaps the seriousness of the times that we're in now, the seriousness of the spiritual warfare, the apparent attempt to take over, um, take over the world, in fact, as evidenced by this pandemic and... Um, what may be in store for us if, God forbid, um, the United States loses its essential sovereignty in the next election and so forth. And in this context, it is all the more important to keep in mind that it's not enough to say that God always wins and that God is always victorious. It's actually more than that. Just as God, you know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and St. John said, God is love. God is victory. God is victory. He not only is victorious, but that sounds like he could be victorious or he might not be victorious. It's like a, you know, it's as though he were in a wrestling match, arm wrestling match with Satan, you know, and like, oh, God seems to be winning. Oh, Satan seems to be winning. Oh, no, look, God's about to pull it off. He's about to pull it off. Yes, he wins. It's not like that at all. He is, by definition, victory. And any suffering and any apparent calamity that we go through is an expression of his will because God only cares about, I mean, he cares about our happiness, of course. But there's one real, real stake. You know, there's, there, there's one set of stakes in this battle, so to speak, between God and Satan, and that is individual human souls. That is the coin of the realm. If God allows a lot of suffering on earth, he's doing it in order to save more souls. He cares about the salvation of souls more than anything else. Just look at him at the cross, on the cross, right? Jesus on the cross. And in fact, in Fatima, I think I might have made a slip of the tongue last week, in which case I apologize. Uh, for the date of uh, Mary's apparitions in Fatima and her final apparition. But in any case, in Fatima, look at what Mary kept saying. She kept saying, unless man repents, there'll be a worse war. Um, the, the man didn't repent, and there was a worse war, and it was World War II. To bring about repentance, to bring about the salvation of souls, the only reason God allows suffering is to, in the long run, bring about the salvation of souls. So if, in fact, we're entering into a horrible, horrible state of the world, and I pray fervently that we're not, we're entering into it not because God wasn't powerful enough to have a victory over Satan. We're entering into it because that, given the misbehavior of mankind, that was necessary to save more souls. So anyway... Back to, back to Charlie Rich, so I can at least start with Charlie Rich. Um, okay, so uh, he grew up in this little village in Eastern Europe. Um, he was very, had a very pious nature, 
And uh, as a small child, like five years old, he would get up every morning at five o'clock to go with the grown-up men to synagogue um, to pray. And after the morning prayers would um, study most of the day, um, learning Hebrew and so forth. They didn't have schools in those days, but the parents would uh, give a little money to a um, you know pious man to teach the little boys a Torah, the Old Testament, and to uh, Hebrew and so forth. Um, and let me now go to some words of Charlie Rich. It was in the mountains of Hungary I really got to know God in an intimate way, through the Hasidic way of finding God, in the outdoors, in the woods and streams and flowers, etc. At the age of 10, I was a good Hasidic boy, drinking into my soul the beauty of God. So let me um, uh, give a little, a little uh, picture of this, I guess. First of all, uh, this is where he grew up, more or less, where that little red flag is. You can see it's right now, it's um, the southern edge of Poland, but you can see below it Hungary. And my um, guess or understanding is that Slovakia was uh, in those days a part of Hungary, so, or at least not a separate country. Um, and that's why Charlie referred to it as Hungary. And here is a picture of the Carpathian Mountains, um, where he grew up, where the village was. You can see how, how beautiful and in some sense isolated it is. And because in that last line he talked about loving to go into the woods alone and commune with God and speak to God and so forth, here is a picture of a little wooded scene in the um, Carpathian Mountains. So with that, let's, let's, let's go back to the words of um, Charlie. So that he's describing his childhood. There were no schools where I lived, so individual Jewish men would teach the boys to read and write in Yiddish, uh, the reading consisting of, of the first five books of the Old Testament known as the Holy Torah. I'll just make a couple of comments here. Uh, Yiddish was the uh, language of the Jews in Eastern Europe. And um, uh, anyway, I won't go there. But uh, it was a mix of Hebrew with the language that the Jews spoke, a mixture of German and, and Polish and Hebrew, because the secular language around them was whatever it was, Polish and, or Russian and, and German and so forth. Um, this is this is a little bit uh, tangential. Only a few will know why why I'm saying this and what it has to do with anything. But um, there is a um, anti-Semitic slur about Jews today, saying that they're not really descendants of Abraham, but they're descendants of the Khazars, which was a country in uh, Eastern Europe, which was in fact. Um, the, where the king had converted to to um, Judaism, and he made his followers convert to Judaism, and that's who the Jews of today are. They're the descendants of the Khazars, so actually, racially, they have no relationship to the Old Testament Jews. It's absolute nonsense. Um, and the way one way you can prove it's absolute nonsense is that the language of this country was essentially Turkish, uh, it was not a Eastern European language. It was not anything like German. It was Turkish. And yet Yiddish, which was the language of the Jews in Eastern Europe, shows has no trace of the Khazar language at all. No trace of the Khazar language. So if the Jews of Eastern Europe were, you know, two, three, four hundred years later, the descendants of the Khazars, Yiddish would have some of the Khazar language in it, but it doesn't. That's just the easiest way to disprove this canard um, that, uh, that somehow the Khazars became the Jews of today. Uh, in fact, what happened was that, you know, okay, the king says all of you guys have to become Jewish. So the whole country, you know, pretends to be Jewish. The king dies, you know, the country, you know, they, 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 they don't stay Jewish, essentially. They just went back to whatever they were you know, before that decree came down. But anyway, 
uh, and also, by the way, the other thing about this line of um, that I just read of from Charlie Rich is that among religious Jews, the first five books of the Old Testament, Torah, that is, um, you know, Genesis, Exodus, um, <laughs> uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, um, have a stature head and shoulders above the rest of sacred scripture because they were essentially dictated by God to Moses. So uh, the vast majority of Jewish Bible study is on the Torah, which is one of the reasons why uh, Jews aren't as familiar with the references to Christ that we get, for instance, in the prophets and in Isaiah and so forth, is although they do study the prophets, they you know, it's it's a tiny percentage of the um, time and energy they spent on they spend on the Old Testament. Okay, back to Charlie Rich. My spiritual life during those early years consisted in attending the morning prayers, which took place in the synagogue, which began before daybreak. Each morning, I found myself walking to the synagogue to attend these early morning prayers. So, getting my now getting up for mass around three or four a.m. every morning is no problem. As far back as I can remember, I found going to the synagogue a form of intense delight, and prayer was a form of recreation to me, and a source of deep joy, making me feel surrounded by supernatural forces. From as far back as I can remember, I never felt myself alone in the world, and this even though I only had one friend. I felt spiritual forces making themselves my companions, and I felt them with me, wherever I found myself, especially in the beautiful Hungarian forests in which I used to spend hours without any other boys. So he clearly had a uh, relationship with God and uh, a great piety and, and inward um, life of prayer and love of God. This is why I'm doing this, by the way. If you've watched my series on um, what is Judaism, in the good form of the Jewish nature, there is a very beautiful hunger and love for God, which is only logical because that's what the Jews are, right? They're the people that God chose to yearn for God and actually yearn for the Messiah and pray for the Messiah and live for the Messiah for 2,000 years before he came. So... You know, there is this, this innate Jewish need for God, hunger for God, that's very beautifully reflected even in clueless Judaism, in other words, in Judaism that, doesn't, that hasn't become the Catholic Church, but that gets fulfilled so beautifully and totally in the relationship with God, which is only available through the Catholic Church. So let me get to Charlie getting there. So anyway, out of the age of seven... Um, his, he went away to school in that village I mentioned in Dukla. And also, unfortunately, his father um, emigrated to the United States uh, first, before the family, when he was a small boy at around that time, so that, um, and to, to make enough money to pay for the rest of his family to come to the United States. So actually, the father was in the United States and the family was without the father, um, for, uh, I believe it was somewhere seven years, somewhere between seven and ten years, while the father was making enough money to bring the family over. Um, yeah, I think that was, actually it was a little less than that. I think it was before, between when uh, Charlie was five years old and when he was ten years old, so it was for five years. Then when Charlie was ten years old, the family... Uh, was able to come to New York and join the father and the family moved to New York. So they moved from these beautiful Carpathian mountains and, you know, uh, you know, village in the middle of the forest, where, as I pointed out the slide before, where Charlie would, you know, spend his, his free time there, essentially, in that forest. And they moved to the Lower East Side. So all of a sudden, Charlie went from there to there. <laughs> so here I have a bunch of pictures of the Lower East Side at the turn of the century. Um, here's, here's one of them. It's actually, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a men's clothing store. Anyway, 
obviously a very, very, very uh, different world and uh, a very um, harsh and chaotic and noisy um, and uh, uprooted from the presence of God in the same way that the presence of God was there or, or was palpable in those forests and in that natural beauty and so forth. So um, I'm just uh, flipping through some of these slides. Um, and you can see, by the way, the Hebrew in, all, in the signs and so forth. The Lower East Side was overwhelmingly um, uh, Jewish immigrants in those days. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, where's, where's this? Um, uh, here's another one. Uh, um, that actually, that sign up there says Bosher Kosher. Um, it was obviously a, a ultra kosher meat market, and um, just just for a little comic relief, I um, here is a uh, here is a haberdashery, a um, uh, hat store on the Lower East Side in, in those days. Okay, I hope I'm doing the right thing telling this joke, <laughs> but. Who? Um, I started, so I'd better go on. I hope it's okay. If not, tell me in the chat, and I'll never do this again. But you know that Jewish boys are circumcised at seven days old. And the person, I won't go into details. If you don't know what circumcision is, I'm not going to tell you. But you probably do know what circumcision is. And the uh, person who performs a circumcision is known as a moel. That is a uh, kind of a vocation. Sometimes the Moel is a rabbi. Sometimes he isn't a rabbi. Um, but he is you know, trained and licensed and ordained, so to speak, to perform ritual circumcisions. So anyway, one day, I'll, uh, this is why it's, uh, I had that picture of the haberdashery. Haberdashery is a hat store, right? Up there. So anyway, um, so uh, one day... Uh, man is walking down the street on the Lower East Side and he passes a haberdashery or he passes a store. It's just a, it's just a store window and the store window is full of hats. And so he goes and he needs a hat. So he goes into the store and he says, you know, I want to buy a hat. And the guy in the store says, I'm sorry, I don't sell any hats. I'm a moil. And um, the guy says, well, if you don't sell any hats, how come your store window is full of hats? And he says, I'm a moil. What do you want it should be full of? <laughs> so anyway, enough. So that's why I put up that slide. Um, back to Charlie Rich. So anyway, he finds himself um, on the Lower East Side. And not only that, um, the family, of course, has to make a living. So his sister, Stella, who's a few years older than him, goes to work in literally a sweatshop. Those were um, garment factories in slum apartments, like this is actually a picture of a sweatshop, where um, the, uh, the women or the men would work uh, perhaps 60 hours a week. And she went to work for, in a sweatshop for $3 a week. Um, the father um, had a job in a retail store where he made $11 a week. And uh, Charlie also went to work in a... Um, uh, in a kind of a sweatshop in a, in a, uh, 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 that made suits. Um, so anyway, uh, and then he ended up getting a job as a waiter, which I guess was a little bit of a better job. And, uh, uh, anyway, so he lost his faith in this environment. I'm, I'm drowning here. So let me get back on track. He lost his faith and he is, you know, making a living on tips and on the whatever it is, $2, well, I shouldn't say $2 a week. I don't know what it was. A couple of, you know, maybe $10 a week as a waiter. And um, he, there is no God. And he, you know, with no God, you know, there's no purpose to life. And there's no meaning to life. There's no reason to keep living. And in fact, he tried to, you know, he, he, he was searching for some meaning in God, uh, excuse me, meaning in life. Um, he started reading all of the great literature. He was spent all his free time 
at the New York Public Library trying to find a meaning of life. And he read all of the great literature of the time. I shouldn't say of the time. I mean, he read all of Shakespeare. He wrote all, read all of the great literature. He uh, read a lot of the philosophers. He read a lot of Catholic theology. He was searching for a meaning of life. And um, he, uh, he did come across the Catholic classics. And I'll read what he said about them. Here in Catholicism, I discovered a world molded along lines which were closest to the desires of my heart. I began to read all of the great writers I could find on Catholicism, from St. Augustine to Carl Adam. In these books I found living waters at which I quenched my thirst for the supernatural and the divine, a thirst which was implanted in me ever since I can remember. However, he didn't go further. He didn't take the next step. And he was also reading other philosophy. And he um, turned to Spinoza and Pantheism. I have a show on that too. It's in that What is Judaism series. And um, God became everything and nothing because he just suffused the universe in this pantheistic way. And he, um, it was obviously a wrong path. I'll read what he said about that. God became everything and nothing. What was I to do now? Where was I to turn with any hope? I lost faith in all philosophy. I turned in my desperation to write the writings of the mystics, to Eckhart, to Burma, to Plotinus and Emerson. But here I met with even greater disappointment. Under the maze of confused words which concealed their doctrines lay nothing but obscurity and darkness. The further I waded into them, the more hopelessly entangled everything became. They only led me deeper into the darkness from which I sought to emerge. I'm reading this for one reason, because that's such a beautiful phrase about this, these false philosophers, these philosophers who are not in touch with God. I'll just repeat that sentence. Under the maze of confused words which concealed their doctrines. Because that is the case when you read these guys. Um, a maze of confused words which conceal their doctrines, under which lie nothing but obscurity and darkness. So in fact, his reading of these um, non-religious philosophers simply drew him deeper into the despair and the darkness. Uh, at the age of 33, he became more and more depressed. He um, actually was fired from his job as a waiter, and he tried to kill himself several times. Let me pull up a picture of him. At around this time, this is actually when he's in his early 20s. Um, I think it's very beautiful. I mean, you see, you see the depth in the eyes and you see the, the despair in a way. You see the intelligence. Um, anyway, that's actually his, from his naturalization certificate when he was 23, uh, 22. Anyway, he uh, tried to kill himself a couple of times. Uh, once by taking poison, um, from which I'm tempted to say he never recovered completely. I think it was two weeks before he could walk again. Um, it didn't kill him, obviously, but um, you know he was uh, uh, unable to walk for two weeks. And he actually, although he lived to 99, much to his chagrin, because all he wanted to do after his conversion was, you know, have the fullness of God on the other side of this life. But he lived till 99, but he suffered a lot of um, health problems for all of his life, which I think came, from, um, uh, came in part from that poisoning. Anyway, and then a few months later, he tried to kill himself by hanging himself in a Bronx park. Uh, but a man passed by just as he was about to hang himself, and he lost his courage, and he didn't. So the next day, the next day, it was a very hot day, and he's wandering around, and he stopped in what he called a cool-looking stone church. In other words, this is the days before air conditioning. This would have been, let's see, 33. So this would have been the early 30s, and um, it's a hot day. The coolest place was an empty stone Catholic church. So he stopped in the church just to get out of the heat. Now, he was afraid that he'd be thrown out of the church because he looked kind of like a bum, 
But he figured, um, so what if, these are his words, so what if they throw me out? I want to die anyway. So he stops in this church, and I actually have a picture of the church. Um, so um, there is a picture of the church. It was St. Joseph's um, in the Bronx. Uh, it's um, not a parish anymore. I think the church is still there, but I think the, um, it got merged with another parish. And um, in fact, this is what it looks like today. I hope it wasn't quite as dreary back then in the early 30s. But there, that um, gray structure uh, in the upper left corner of the picture is St. Joseph's Church. So anyway, so um, Charlie Rich goes into that church just to get out of the heat. And let me read, um, let me go back to at least a somewhat more attractive picture of the church. And let me read um, his experience. This is his, his conversion experience. At the age of 33, I had read every important literary work held famous in the eyes of men, and yet there was something keenly ill at ease in my spiritual and intellectual outlook. I had even read the writings of the great Christian writers like St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bernard, St. Catherine of Siena, and St. Teresa of Avila, and yet there was so much distress in my spiritual and intellectual makeup that I thought of suicide as the way out of the spiritual and intellectual misery I was in. I felt like a famished person who had not eaten for days, and my soul was hungry for the truths of the Christian religion that I did not know how to attain. Faith failed me, and I felt that without supernatural faith I could not go on living, and this in the same way as anyone would soon die if he was not given food to eat. So despairing of ever arriving at the truth of religion, I went to the Bronx Park with the intention of hanging myself. I had picked out a tree and had a rope in my hand when someone passed by and courage failed me. I made another attempt to take my life and this also failed. Anyway, that day I passed a Catholic church. It was a hot summer day and I felt weary and exhausted. So I thought if I went inside, I could cool off. But I was afraid that not being a Catholic, I would be unwelcome, as this I was shabbily dressed and unkempt. But overcoming my fears, I went inside and found myself completely alone. I went into this church because I was weary of my existence, so weary of it that I had even tried to bring it to an unlawful end. I went into that church to find what I had so far been unable to find, something unknown and ineffable, something which would enable me to go on living and not die out of sheer despair. So he goes into that church and he sits down under a window, a stained glass window of Jesus stilling the waters, stilling the storm in the boat on the Sea of Galilee with the disciples. Now that is not the window at St. Joseph's Church as far as I know. It's as, as close as I could come. It's another stained glass window of Jesus stilling the waters. So he's sitting in that empty church alone and he looks up at this window and he says to himself, if only I could believe that the words in the gospel are really true, that Christ really existed and that these words are exactly those that came from his own mouth, were uttered from his own human lips and that they are literally true. Oh, if this were only a fact, how glorious and wonderful that would be, how consoled, happy, and comforted I would be to know that Christ was really divine, that he was God's own Son come down from another world to this earth to save us all. Could it be possible, I felt, that that which seemed too wonderful to be true actually was true? All of a sudden, something flashed through my mind, and I heard these words spoken in it. Of course it is true. Christ is God, is God come down to make himself visible in the flesh. The words in the Gospels are true, literally true. The next thing I remember was that I found myself on my knees in fervent prayer and thanksgiving. From there on, the story takes on a delicacy which can hardly be expressed in the words of earth, for it has to do with the remarkable experience that took place in my whole spiritual and intellectual makeup during those few moments. I kept kneeling in thanksgiving for a favor from heaven that I never thought would ever be granted me in the present life. 
a favor from heaven which enabled me to believe in the divinity of Christ. God himself came to my rescue that day. He himself spoke to me with his own voice, saying to me that Christ is God. Those few minutes brought such a profound change in me spiritually and intellectually that I have since that time been unable to recognize the self I had been prior to that experience, an experience the full nature of which will only be able to be known after this life is over. I felt a deep gratitude in my heart for something which made me feel very happy, but what it was I could not say. All I know is that from that day on, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ took on a significance which it never had before. There was an ineffable fragrance about the words Jesus Christ, a sweetness with which nothing can be compared. The sound of these words to this day fills me with a strange, inexpressible joy, a joy which I feel does not come from this world. I have, since my baptism and First Communion, acquired a happiness which I would not exchange for anything in all the world. It has given me a peace of mind and a serenity of outlook which I did not think was possible on this earth. Amen. I don't really want to comment on this too much because, because I don't want to dilute it. Um, I will point out how similar, in many ways, this experience sounds to um, Alphonse Radisbone's experience of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, he's made the same comment that those few moments pro produced such a profound change in him that he can't recognize himself afterwards and before. He can't recognize, in some sense, as the same person. Um, it obviously reminds me a little bit of my own experience of God. Um, and um, I'm going to make a little digression about my 40th year uh, HBS reunion, Harvard Business School reunion yesterday, which is, I, I don't understand the mystery. I don't understand the mystery. There seems to be two kinds of people. There seems to be people who can't reconcile themselves to life without God. So if they don't have it, they're absolutely miserable. I would put Woody Allen in that category, actually. I think he's pretty miserable. And then there's a greater mystery about people who can be happy without God or apparently happy with God, without God, uh, satisfied without God. Um, I guess that's not our problem. Our problem is simply to, uh, what's, what, I'm not remembering the lines from St. Paul's letter to Timothy, preach the gospel in season and out of season, whether people are willing to hear or not willing to hear. I guess it's, it's, it's God's problem to sort it out and, um, and, you know, whose eyes he'll lift the veil over and whose eyes he won't lift the veil over. Our job is the same in either case which is simply to um, preach the gospel. And, um, you know, what Jesus said about sowing the seed, some of it fell on the rocky path, some of it, you know, uh, fell on uh, dry ground, some of it sprang up and was trampled underfoot, and some of, some of it spread, uh, landed on fertile soil, and bore fruit a hundredfold. So I guess our job is just to cast the seed, you know, to just um, share the gospel. And, um, yeah, sure, a lot of it will fall on rocky ground or on the path or whatever. But that's not our problem. But it is our problem. If we don't, if we don't sow the seed, if we don't spread out the seed, then the responsibility on, is on us. Earlier this week, I think the, the reading, the first reading in Mass was that reading, I think it's Jeremiah, but I'm not absolutely sure, about the watchman who has to, you know, call out the warning. And if the people don't repent after you've called out the warning, then it's their problem. But if you don't call out the warning, <laughs> it's your problem. The sin is on you of them not repenting. So that's really our situation. And in that light, I will say another little personal story about that HBS reunion yesterday was, okay, I'm, I'm watching the... Um, uh, the, the Zoom screen, you know, and there are whatever, 30 of us on the Zoom screen or something like that. 
and I'm looking at all the faces of my classmates and all talking about the most important, we were all to answer the question about the most significant thing, you know, experience of our life in the last 40 years. And they were talking about their vacation in Bali or whatever, or, or um, you know, some adventure like that. I'm just looking at them and I'm saying, I can't open my mouth. When is my turn? I'm not going to be open, able to open my mouth. You know, it's such a hostile crowd. So what do I do? I um, blank out the screen for five minutes. I go upstairs. I fortify myself with a little coffee. I take a deep breath. I go down back downstairs. You know, I, I open up the screen again and my turn comes <laughs> and I tell him what the most significant thing in my life was, was, you know, God revealed himself to me and I became a fanatic Catholic. And ever since then, I'm a full time evangelist, you know, went over like a lead balloon. OK, I mean, literally just just drop there. Plop. That was end of story. Um, but I'm very glad I did that, of course, because because I, I you know, that's my job. And what they do with it is their problem. But it's my problem if I hadn't taken the opportunity to do that. And who knows? Who knows what seed might be planted? Um, but in any case, so that's our job. Isn't it nice? We have such an easy job. We have such an easy job. Just, you know, get to heaven ourselves and bore people by talking about God. Mention something else about Charlie Rich. Is all he would tolerate talking about was um god and uh yeah, there was one time when he was getting in a car actually he was getting in a car with a trappist prior uh to take a car trip somewhere and um he says very sternly before they get in the car in this car we talk only about god i mean he wouldn't have anything else for the rest of his life um the only worthy topic of thought or conversation was God. Back to Charlie Rich. Um, okay, so he has this experience. Um, all he wants to do, of course, is get baptized. The first priest he went to said, oh, it would take a long period of instruction. You know, RCIA type thing, only more in those days. We're talking about the early 30s, right? At that point, Charlie was about to give up. You know, uh, I mean, he was back in despair. Anyway, uh, and the priest was a little bit concerned about this, so he went to talk to his spiritual director about what should I do about this weird Jewish guy. And so Charlie had an appointment with that spiritual director. His name was Father Clark. He's apparently was a saint. I mean, anyway, the, the Jesuit community in New York in those days, that, that was when they were still Catholic, seriously Catholic, um, revered him as a, a, a very, very holy and insightful spiritual director. And um, so anyway, so the first priest sent Charlie to Father Clark. And after a two hour conversation, Father Clark said that Charlie didn't need any other instruction and should be baptized immediately. Um, so uh, anyway, same thing actually happened to Alphonse Radisbone, right? that he was able to be baptized immediately. And the same thing actually happened to Edith, St. Edith Stein. I'm not sure if I ever mentioned that. But when she um, sought baptism, she was also told that she would have to go through a long period of instruction. And she told the uh, priest, or she asked the priest, quiz me, <laughs> quiz me now. And she was so well informed in the faith. And, you know, she had done so much reading and study and so forth that, um, you know, she passed with flying colors and she could be uh, baptized immediately. Um, anyway. So anyway, so he was immediately baptized and he immediately uh, experienced a very deep states of uh, prayer. You could say mystical states of prayer. And he would get lost in prayer for hours and hours. And uh, all he wanted to do was pray. All he wanted to do was pray. So, of course, he tried to join a religious community. And he spent time with uh, several orders. He lived with the Jesuits. He tried out the Trappists. He ended up living with the Jesuits, too. But he tried out the Trappists. He tried out the Carmelites. He tried out the pa Paulists. And in each case, he did not work because he could not 
there are two ways to look at this. One is he didn't want to do anything but pray, which is true. Um, but the other thing is God wouldn't let him do anything but pray. In other words, God sabotaged any attempts of his to um, do the work that he was supposed to do in addition to prayer. Because, of course, all of these orders, um, life consists of a combination of work and prayer. For instance, when he was with, I believe it was the Trappists, he was supposed to wash up the dishes after the meal. Um, and uh, so the meal is over and he's in the kitchen with the dishes and he says to himself, well, no one will mind if I drop into the chapel for a minute or two for prayer and then come back into the kitchen. But anyway, when he dropped in the chapel for prayer, he was drawn into this deep state of prayer. And hours went by without him noticing it. Anyway, so anyway, the prior did not take kindly to going in the kitchen an hour later and finding Charlie not there and the dishes still piled up dirty. So that was the end of his Trappist career or whatever. So anyway, so um, that sabotaged him, his attempts at the other forms, the real forms of religious life. However, he eventually um, finagled permission from the Jesuits to live in their house, their religious house in New York City, and just spend all his time in prayer. So he wasn't a Jesuit, but he was allowed to live there. He was tolerated. Many of them resented him for, for not doing any work and taking up space and eating their food. But um, he basically lived out his very long life um, with the Jesuits in New York City. Um, uh, the Jesuit house where the Jesuits who taught at uh, St. Joseph's School, um, uh, which, um, is it St., let me find the slide I have. Um, Saint, excuse me, St. Francis Xavier School. Uh, and I did not actually make a note of whether it's in Manhattan or not. I think it's in Lower Manhattan. Here's a picture uh, today's, I mean, in other words, a modern picture of uh, St. Francis Xavier School. Obviously, uh, the building was the same. It looked the same when Charlie lived there. And um, the Jesuits had a house, I believe it was next door, where they lived, which is where Charlie lived out his very long life. You know, he was always given the worst room or whatever. I think one room was under the stairs, and, and the final room he had was um, like 12 feet by 8 feet or something. Um, and just, you know piled high with books, but he lived out his life there as a contemplative. Uh, his daily routine would be the following, which was he would rise at about 2.30 in the morning every morning, uh, have a quick cup of coffee uh, to wake up, uh, go to the chapel to pray until a little bit before 5 a.m., and then he would serve Mass for one of the Jesuits at 5 a.m., and then take a little nap afterwards and um, have breakfast uh, at 7.30 a.m. and then basically spend the rest of the day until dinner um, praying and sometimes doing some uh, spiritual writing. He, he kept memoirs, um, uh, not memoirs, meditations. Uh, everything I'm reading of his come from those. Um, do some spiritual reading. He would take one or two uh, brief walks during the day and, and uh, break very uh, briefly for lunch. He actually stopped eating with the Jesuits and would just take his lunch in the kitchen in his, to save time, not waste more time, so he could go back to prayer. So he basically was praying 12, 14 hours a day all his life. So um, that is his life. And um, now I get to read read um his words uh, first of all j these are just some comments he made in various places about what would happen to him in prayer i i think it's called the prayer of quiet actually i i shouldn't say that i shouldn't presume um he reached a high state i think of of union with christ where um he would be drawn into prayer and hours as i said would go by without him being aware of it I'll just read a couple of comments of his. I often felt that I had gone off somewhere and would be afraid that I could not come back when he got drawn into this prayer. And um, here's another, you know, just little 
comment he wrote, about two weeks ago, I was on the steps leading to the ground floor when all of a sudden I felt my inner being light up in a way I would not attempt to describe. It was as though I were suddenly transported into another world, the one where eternity is. The whole thing lasted only a few seconds. It was a feeling of delight so excessive that I no longer felt myself to be where I am. It was as if I saw God himself. Um, anyway, the, the mere fact, oh, I, I, I don't have pictures of him in prayer. Um, uh, mm, let me see if I have a picture of him in prayer that I can at least hold up to the camera. By the way, in the description under this video, there are some books of Charlie Rich, which are available uh, actually for free um, as PDF files. And um, uh, I think they probably even include, uh, well, I'm not going to guess at what they include. Uh, they might include the book that I'm, I'm uh, looking at, which is um, Hungry for Heaven, which is uh, his biography written by Rhonda Chervin. Uh, who's another Jewish convert, who's actually a friend of mine. This isn't the world's greatest picture of him in prayer and might be useful for some of you. Um, there, you see it there. Uh, I don't know if this camera will focus. There he is. He looks like he's napping. I, he is napping. He's at prayer in the chapel with his head resting on his arms. And that might be edifying for you if, in fact, <laughs> you pray like that. Um, uh because that's kind of important, you know, in other words, God really loves us and uh, we're all unique individuals. And, um, you know, you usually see pictures of saints in prayer where they're sitting, you know, ramrod straight upright like this on their knees, like this for hours. And um, God bless them. But if you're a schlumpy old <laughs> Yiddish New York Jew and, um, you know, you're kind of like this on the pew, uh, in prayer, and you're actually awake and in prayer, apparently that's okay with God too. So that's why I wanted to show you that, that, that picture of him. Um, uh, so I see a comment which says, prayer of quiet is being still and listening to Jesus. I'll just add a little word to that, which is prayer of quiet is being still and listening to Jesus and having Jesus communing with you and you hearing it. In other words, it's not listening for Jesus. It's listening to Jesus after the connection has been made. I, I'm not contradicting what you say, but I just want to point out it's listening to Jesus and not listening for Jesus. And um, that actually... Before I read more of him, I'm going to read a little story of what happened to him at the draft board, okay? Because because um, he is, uh, in 1944, he receives a draft notice, right? This is World War II. The United States has entered World War II. So he has to show up at the draft board. And, um, okay, so first he's in the room with like a hundred other men, uh, they're stripped to their underpants, right? Because this is the physical examination to see if they're going to draft you. So he's in a room in his underpants with, you know, a hundred other men in their underpants. And they're whatever, they're talking or smoking or swapping stories. And he is furiously praying the rosary, right? In his underwear. And then the time comes for uh, his interview with a psychiatrist who's a Jewish psychiatrist, right? So here's uh, what happens. He got to his interview with a Jewish psychiatrist and he told the psychiatrist, look, uh, or the psychiatrist says, what kind of work do you do, you know? And he says, look, I can't work because I'm a man of prayer, right? Because all he did, you know, this is like 10 years, 12 years into this life of full-time prayer. So he says, hey, I, can't, I cannot work. I'm a man of prayer. The doctor asks him, how long do you pray? Uh, his answer eight hours a day, which is a surprise the doctor. Sarcastically, the Jewish doctor psychiatrist asks, and does God ever speak to you? Charlie answers, yes. <laughs> psychiatrist says, 
What does he say? <laughs> Charlie says, when God speaks, there are no words, just a deep experience of his presence. <laughs> anyway, he got turned down for the draft. He was the only one of those like hundred who got turned down for the draft. So anyway, in the end, uh, here's the, as, as, as the story ends. Um, I'll just read this description. This is from his biography. This reply that when God speaks, there are no words, just a deep experience of his presence. This reply seemed to disappoint the psychiatrist, but was probably sufficient to make the authorities conclude that any man who stands half naked praying the rosary in a public room or prays eight hours a day would not fit in with the others in the barracks. In the end, when everyone else was taken, Charlie was left alone in the waiting room and told, you've been rejected. So there, there you have that. Now, Charlie's spirituality, his writings. So here we go. Um, okay, first, first aspect of his spirituality. Everything is about eternity. We've talked about this a lot, right, on this show. All, all of these saints, uh, Saint Ignatius's first principle and foundation, it's all about eternity. And I will comment that this is not only true for religious and priests and Jesuits and contemplatives, it's true for all of us. It is all about eternity. I don't care if you're like my sister-in-law, who is a mother of 10 children, uh, age range, you know, probably about one year to, to 22 or 23. Um, she's said that she has not slept through the night in 22 years. She always had a baby. She's very busy, of, of course, needless to say. Um, but it's true of her. And it's true of somebody who has to work 60 hours a week to support his family as well as true of the contemplative. It's all about eternity. The, the difference is um, what God is asking us to do to earn our heaven is different for different ones of us. And for some of us, it is being a, a devoted mother and raising, you know, 15 children for heaven. And for others, it is being a contemplative praying 12 hours a day or being a priest ministering you know, to your flock of faithful for 16 hours a day. Um, the, the jobs we're asked to do are all different, but our job, so to speak, is to do what God is asking us to do in order to gain heaven. And if we do what he's asking us to do, in his presence so to speak or for him or uh, with regard to him it doesn't have to be conscious but if you know if we do it understanding understanding things then in fact it is a value in the eyes of heaven you know whether it's you know feeding the children or cooking dinner or mowing the lawn or or working on the assembly line in the factory it's a value in the eyes of heaven if it is being done as part of the vocation we've been given, if we're doing our, our, our duty faithfully. I had to say that so that you don't, th there's nobody thinks, and some people do make the mistake of thinking, that um, what they're doing in doing their daily duty is somehow a distraction from their... Um, their eternity from doing what they're supposed to do for their eternity it isn't our our roles are all different our vocations are all different however whatever our role or vocation is it's all about the value it has in the eyes of heaven so anyway charlie of course had the luxury of um everything he had to do a value in the eyes of heaven pretty much was overtly about heaven and about his relationship with Christ. So anyway, uh, on to his words. In my case, it would have been in vain to have been born if God had not been good enough to extend me the grace 
to be a member of the mystical body of Christ that the Church of Rome is. Without the life Christ is, there is no life at all. And for him also, the life Christ is can only be had where he now so blessedly is. It is for heaven we have been made, and for no other earthly good thing. It is to heaven every good and beautiful experience points and has in view. That's clearly true, right? It is for heaven we have been made. And, yeah, anyway, I'll just continue with Charlie. I won't babble. I became a Catholic so that I may in that way be happy, not just for a few years, but forever and ever. I became a Catholic that I may in that way get the grace to one day participate in the joys of the angels and saints in the life to come. It is to that life the grace of conversion is meant to lead. It is meant to lead to a life of happiness, excuse me, it is meant to lead to a happiness we cannot now imagine or conceive. It is not for this life alone we are Catholics. We are Catholics that by being so we may get the grace to live the life Christ himself is and which can never have a limit to it. It is for the boundlessness they, those who are in heaven have that we have been born. Does not St. Paul say that if our hopes in Christ are limited to this life only, we are the most pitiable of men? We have not been born to be happy on earth. I did not become a Catholic to be happy in the present life, but in the one to come, my holy Catholic faith being a ticket to the eternal and everlasting kind of joys they experience in heaven. It is the heaven of unimagined bliss my becoming a Catholic has in view. It is not of this earth my holy Catholic faith speaks to me. It does so of the transcendent good Jesus can alone be for a human being. It is not for this life alone that we are Catholics. It is not the point of being Catholic isn't to be happy in this life. Although, if I can say so, it, it, in a way, it's the only way to be happy in this life. It's not a way not to suffer. It may be that Catholics are asked to suffer more than other people. That's quite possible. Look at the lives of saints. Uh, look at the lives of martyrs. However, there is a difference between suffering and misery. Suffering, which is not understood, is misery. Suffering, which is understood and offered to God in union with the suffering of Christ, is still suffering, but it isn't misery. <laughs> it's not despair. It's not pointless. It's, it's, it isn't misery. And in fact, the saints actually find joy in it. They can find joy in suffering because they know that they're uniting it to the suffering of Christ and that it is a purchasing grace and saving souls and consoling the heart of Jesus. And they actually choose suffering for that reason. They even add to their suffering for that reason. So anyway, however... The point of being Catholic isn't to be happy in this life. It is to be happy for all eternity. <laughs> and um, I've said this before, but it's also true that everybody who gets to heaven is not in the same situation. All of the saints, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Therese of Avila, St. Faustina, have all explicitly said that souls in heaven are all perfectly happy. Their cup of happiness is filled to the brim. But the greater saints they are, the bigger their cup is. So they're all filled to the brim, but some have really big cups, you know, have 40-gallon barrels filled to the brim of bliss and union with God. And some have maybe thimbles or shot glasses filled to the brim with bliss and union with God. And St. Faustina in her diary at one point, Jesus shows her this. And St. Faustina says, uh, thank you, Jesus, for showing me this, because now I understand that I would willingly undergo all of the tortures, all of the sufferings of all of the martyrs throughout time combined to gain 
one tiny iota of greater blessedness in heaven. Uh, I don't have the quote in front of me, but that's, that's the quote. Um, so anyway, so it's for that that we're Catholic. Um, and by the way, it's for that that, again, that's, you know, once, assuming that we're going to kind of somehow scrabble our way, you know, claw our way into heaven ourselves, at that point, our job is to help others end up there because ending up in heaven is the entire purpose of life on earth. Anybody want to contradict me, please contradict me. Tell me what other purpose there can possibly be to life on earth other than us getting to heaven and getting other people to heaven. Um... Yeah, maybe. I, I, I don't want to get bogged down there. Um, doing good is its own value, but I'm not sure that can be separated from getting ourselves to heaven and getting others to heaven. Maybe it can. Anyway, on to the next uh, aspect of the spirituality of um, Charlie Rich. The truest happiness on earth is experiencing God. We don't all get to experience God the way Charlie experienced God. But I hope that um, all Catholics who are in a state of grace and take their Catholicism seriously and take their determination to improve seriously and make use of the sacraments, at least from time to time, know the peace of Christ, the peace that Christ alone can give. And that is in itself a happiness, a peace, a joy that, um, you know, only comes from God. Is actually an experience of God. So back to Charlie Rich. One can write and write and write the story of one's conversion and never come to the end. One can never come to the end of enumerating the blessings conferred on one by the grace of being a Catholic. The favors of the Lord I will sing forever. That's from one of the Psalms. Um, in Hebrew, that word is mercy. The mercy of the Lord I will sing forever. What mercy of the Lord can exceed the mercy of God enabling me to be able to believe all the Catholic Church teaches? Can the mercy of God be made more manifest than in the grace extended to us to be members of the only true Church? It is being a Catholic that matters and not any other thing the world has to offer however good and beautiful it may be. The Church of Rome gives us God himself. It does so in all his fullness. A greater gift than God is, a human being cannot hope to receive. Can we receive the gift God himself is when we receive Holy Communion? Can Protestantism and Judaism endow the soul with such a sublime gift? It is to the Church we must go to have God in the fullness he may be experienced by us this side of heaven. To become more intimately united with God than the Church enables us to be by means of the holy sacraments, we must take leave of this life. It is Christ the Church gives us, as he may be had, as he may be had under the conditions of this present life. To have God in all his fullness, we have to have the grace of membership in his mystical body. It is the voice of Christ the Church makes use of when when he says, I came that they might have life and have it to the full. That's a very interesting thought, isn't it? When Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it to the full, was he actually explicitly referring to the sacraments, the sacraments of the Catholic Church? That to have life and have it to the full? I mean, what sense does it make? How can some, if, if we're receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, when we receive the Holy Eucharist every day, perhaps, how could somebody who doesn't receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of God have life to the fullness that somebody who does receive it in a state of grace have it? 
doesn't seem logical to me. It seems to me that what Charlie says here has to be true. That when Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it to the full, he must be referring, at least in part, to the sacraments of the Catholic Church. Continuing with, Char uh, with Charlie. The beauty in the Church is made manifest in the writings of the fathers and doctors of the Church, as well as all the saints who have ever lived. Christ lives in the saints, they exemplify him in their daily lives, and in their example there is the beauty to be found like in the angels and saints in heaven. Do we wish to become beautiful with Christ's own beauty? If we do, it is to the Church of Rome we must go for that kind of beauty. It is to the Church of Rome we have to go to get a living experience of the beauty of Christ's being, seeing that that beauty of his is enshrined and interwoven with everything she does and is. There is the beauty from heaven to be had in the Church of Rome and in the doctrines she promulgates. So one can go on and on writing of all that the Church of Rome is and never come to an end in praising all of her divine qualities. Is she not the heavenly Jerusalem which has descended onto the earth? There is a need in the soul for the presence of God and in his naked essence. For, the member, for a member of the household of the faith, it is Christ in his Eucharistic presence that the saints go to for warmth of heart of mind and body, excuse me, for warmth of heart and mind and the consolations they stand in need of all the time that they find themselves away from the home of the soul that Christ is in the state of glory. Let me just, just comment on this a bit. Um, we are in exile here. <laughs> we are in exile here. And there's something wrong with us if we're perfectly happy here, actually. Because the one that is the only one who can satisfy to the fullness, to the fullest, our desire to love and be loved is Christ. And he is not with us here on earth, as we long for him to be. We will only have the fullness of union with him after we die. Here on earth, we are in exile. We occasionally get little trickles, little sips, perhaps, of that union and of that presence of his. But we are in exile and we should be in a state of dissatisfaction, so to speak. And in that light, let me reread the sentence of Charlie Riches. It is to Christ in his Eucharistic presence that the saints go to for warmth of heart and mind and for the consolations they stand in need of all of the time that they find themselves away from the home of the soul that Christ is in the state of glory. Okay, so while we're in this exile, we go to Christ in his Eucharistic presence for the consolation and for the warmth of heart and mind that we need while we're in this state of exile. Back to Charlie Rich. How joyous, how tremendously peaceful the hours have been that as a Jewish convert I have spent in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. How sorry I feel for my fellow Jews who fail to have their God in that way in their own synagogues. How sorry, oh, excuse me, who is there who would want to go to a synagogue for the warmth of heaven's joys to be had in the Catholic Church? One may ask, what is a church without Christ's sacramental presence in her? Is, not, is that place not and nothing else but just another building? In ancient times, God dwelt in the Ark of the, Ark of the Tabernacle in the temple in Jerusalem. He does so today in the tabernacle on the altar, in front of which a light burns to tell us that the Lord and creator of the universe is there present in the sacramental presence of his divine son. Is this not enough to make a Jewish person dissatisfied with his synagogue form of worship? Is there not a craving in the heart of a Jewish person for Christ the Lord? as he may be had on this earth by means of the Holy Eucharist? What can any religion have to offer which cannot give us Christ in his Eucharistic presence? So that when we go to the place where he is, there, present, 
we get the feeling that we will have when we shall be with Christ in the state of glory, the state of glory which has its beginning right here on this earth, so as to enable us to, quote, taste and see how sweet the Lord is. Christ is sweet to the souls of those who have the grace to have the thought of his being, of his being deeply rooted in that part of themselves made in the image of his Father in heaven. There is a sweetness of Christ to be experienced in the Church of Rome, so that when we walk into a church we get the feeling we are in the infinite bliss that name designates for a believing human being. Um, I'm, I'm skipping over a little bit because um, his English sounds like the English of a, a Lower East Side uh, Jewish immigrant. Uh, sometimes the syntax gets a little bit uh, convoluted. How thankful we should be for the fact that we are Catholic so that we may in that way have Christ with us in the church near where we live. As Catholics, we don't have to go far away to find Christ, seeing that in his sacramental presence, he resides at our very doorsteps in the nearest church we happen to find ourselves in. So that to have heaven, all we have to do is step inside and make an act of faith in the real presence, seeing that in that way we can all rise to the heights of the most sublime kind of prayer. It is in the province of a human being to be able to experience. Uh, anyway, I have to say... I think that Charlie is either there's something very wrong with me and very wrong with most of the Catholics I know, or Charlie is assuming that the graces of prayer that um, have, were offered to him are offered to all Catholics in a state of grace. I'm just saying that so you don't think that you're missing out on something everyone else gets. Um, I think that Charlie is extrapolating his own experience perhaps a bit more broadly than is actually the case. Anyway, another theme in his writing is uh, the, that simple charity requires uh, caring and praying for the conversion of others. That's obvious, I hope. Um, as I think of all of this, I am filled with compassion for the Jewish people of no Christ on their altar to turn to for comfort in their innumerable earthly needs for the kind of consolation to be had in Christ alone in his Eucharistic presence. Why don't men die of grief at the realization they lack the faith to believe in the only true church? How can the Jewish people endure being Jews and not Christians? How are they able to endure the lack of grace Christianity alone can supply them? It is Christ the Jewish people have to have for them to go through the sorrows of their earthly lot. Um, you know, I, I've got to say, with respect to that uh, Harvard Business School reunion yesterday, <laughs> I think I felt that. Why don't men die of grief? Why, why, why don't these people die of grief? <laughs> I'm sorry, but... Um, you know, um, the tragedy. I guess it's a grace in a way. It's a grace and it's a curse that they're not aware of the tragedy of their lives. I'm talking about worldlings, people who live thinking that um, God is a stupid, superstitious myth or something. On the one hand, uh, they, they should die of grief. But on the other hand, they don't die of grief because they are living behind a, like a, a wall of, of um, materialist lack of faith and uh, in a kind of superficial satisfaction at the uh, consolations of um, life on earth. Anyway, I, I can't go there. Uh, however... Um, let me kind of bring this back to where we are, which is, I think that as believing Catholics, we 
should actually share this um, experience of Charlie Rich when he says, why don't men die of grief at the realization they lack the faith to believe in the only true church? And I think it should motivate our, our evangelistic uh, fervor. Um, I think of all this and a dreary feeling comes over me and I pray for those who do not know Christ in his sacramental state and not, they're not knowing Christ in that state. They do not have the grace to love the love Jesus. It's, uh, excuse me, they, they do not have the grace to love the love itself Jesus is. <coughs> Come to me, all you who are weary and find life burdensome, and I will refresh you, Matthew 11. Our Lord says to the Jewish people and to all of us. Charlie Rich is actually reflecting in this passage on how heartbroken he is at the lack of faith in Christ that the Jewish people have. Um, um, okay, now I'm going to read a passage that um, is a little bit mo more relevant for, for saints than it is for us in the world, but on the other hand, we are aspiring to be saints. Um, and so I'll read this. Um, and I will say something. This is quite telling. Uh, what I'm reading is like 99% of it is, is in my book, Honey from the Raw, 16 Jews Find the Sweetness of Christ. Because one of the 16 Jews, uh, maybe you can see this, is actually Charlie Rich. He's, let me see if I can point there. There is a little picture of Charlie Rich. So anyway, so he's one of the 16 uh, witness testimonies in this book. There's me, actually. You see, I'm one of them, too. There's Rhonda Chervin, who was a disciple of Charlie Rich and so forth. As a matter of fact, uh, a number of people I've talked about in these, in these shows However, it's not 100% of what I'm reading. It's only 99% because Ignatius Press, a very good Catholic publisher who published the book, actually censored it because, because they didn't want to be quite as politically incorrect as Charlie Rich is about the fact that everybody who isn't Catholic is in a tragic, tragic, tragic situation um, compared to being Catholic. So anyway, so there are a couple of lines here that they made me take out. Um, so, okay, uh, with the saints, it is Jesus, 24 hours of the day, or not to have him at all in their inner being. The saint does nothing by halves, so his love for Christ falls into this category. Once we get the grace to love Christ, it is hard to have any love in our hearts for anything else God has made, however good and beautiful it may be. I feel sorry for my fellow Jews who fail to love the love itself Jesus is, and I shall never fail to feel sorry for them on this account. A great Jewish convert, the Venerable Francis Lieberman, once wrote, So-and-so is not a Catholic, oh, excuse me, and let me start this over again. Venerable Francis Lieberman once wrote that so-and-so is not a Catholic, he is still a Jew, and therefore nothing. People may consider these harsh words, but to me, they have always spoken the deepest truth that can be uttered, saying that if we fail to love Christ, we are in the eyes of God nothing at all, seeing that Christ constitutes the only reality this universe contains or at least without Christ rooted in our deep inner being, we are nothing at all. In fact, without faith in Christ, nothing has any meaning. At least without faith in him, nothing this world contains has any re relevance for eternity. And not having any relevance for the life to come, what is there on this earth worth taking seriously? Seeing that the sole reason why anything has any meaning for us is due to the fact that that thing is of a nature to last forever. If it is not of a nature to last forever, 
it is of no worth in the eyes of God, and not having any worth in the eyes of God, it has no worth in our own estimation either, so that the attitude we should have towards that thing is as if it had never existed. Now, I will argue that these words are true. They, of course, have to be understood properly because um, um, when we, uh, let's say that our, I'm trying to think of, a, of an example, you know, when we do an act of charity, um, okay, it's a silly example, but it comes to mind. Okay, we're driving down the highway, we pass somebody with a flat tire, um, some helpless person, and we stop and we change their tire for them. Now, that act has a value for all eternity, okay, because of its nature as an act of charity. The flat tire or the tire that isn't flat has no value in the eyes of a God in itself and therefore has no value. But the fact that we change the tire has a value in the eyes of God. And the fact that we change the tire for that person out of charity, in fact, has uh, uh, will last for all eternity. That act of charity will endure for all eternity. The tire won't endure for all eternity. So when Charlie Rich says here that anything that doesn't have a nature to last forever is of no worth in the eyes of God and therefore has no worth in our estimation either and we should have the attitude as though it doesn't exist doesn't apply to that flat tire. It applies to that flat tire as a tire but it doesn't apply to that flat tire with respect to our performing the act of charity for that person. I just wanted to clarify that because, because um, this is a true statement, it, but it has to be understood. <laughs> it has to be understood properly uh, because we don't go through life saying, um, I'm not going to say it's like a Hindu attitude, but it's some, somehow, or, or a Muslim attitude. But we don't go through life saying, oh, that house is burning down. You know, why bother putting out the fire? because that house wasn't going to last forever anyway. Um, you know, we, we, we're not indifferent to the situation other people find themselves in, even though the, the, the temporal object isn't going to last forever. Um, um, we are not born to become this or that. We are born to be the truth seekers God wishes us to be. The truth our Lord himself said he was when he said the words, I am the way, the life, and the truth. Once he has received the grace to be a Catholic, the life of a convert becomes a song he will sing for the rest of his earthly days. And this is especially true of converts from Judaism. Seeing that all such go from darkness to the light to have, be had in Christ alone. Sing to him, sing to the Lord a new song, Psalm 33. We are told by the divine psalmist, this song we sing when we get the grace to become Catholic. All others are in the category of those who cannot, quote, sing a song of the Lord in a foreign land, Psalm 137. The foreign land they were in prior to the gift of faith in the only true church. And so, finding ourselves in the church of Rome, we sing to the Lord the new song he asks that we should sing to him, a song having in itself the joy of heart, which has been given him as a result of his newfound faith. This is very beautiful. This is very Jewish thought in a way. But um, the Psalms are saturated with Psalms about the exile. The Jews, of course, were exiled to Babylon, right? And... Um, they were exiled to Babylon. I actually don't, I think it was only 70 years. But in any case, they were in exile in Babylon. And then finally, Cyrus the king allowed them to return to Jerusalem and they rebuilt the temple and they were able to resume their Jewish worship. And there are many Psalms about the misery and the hopelessness and the despair of being in exile in Babylon. Why? Because they were in exile from God. They weren't where God is. God was in the temple in Jerusalem, 
and they were far from God being in Babylon. So how could they be happy? How could they sing a song? How could they play music? The Psalms are full of this. And Charlie Rich, of course, is correctly saying what was exile in Babylon, you know, in the 6th century BC, 7th century BC, is being outside the Church of Rome because God's presence in the 7th century BC was in the temple in Jerusalem from which they were exiled. And God's presence today is in the tabernacle in the Catholic Church, is in the Eucharist. So everyone who isn't a Catholic is in the state of those Jews when they were in exile in Babylon. And therefore, all of the Psalms that talk about the misery of the exile in Babylon could be understood as applying to people who aren't Catholic. And all of the Psalms that talk about the joy of, you know, I will sing and dance to the Lord as I return to the temple in Jerusalem are for us as Catholics being, you know, approaching the pres- the real presence in, in the tabernacle, in, in the sacramental presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. So all of that Jewish spirituality in the Old Testament transfers so neatly and precisely into the Catholic spirituality that we um, enjoy. Again, a reason to evangelize, right? Um, uh, okay, so back to Charlie Rich. And so, as a former member of Judaism, I sing this song, the, the song of the return to Jerusalem. I sing this song with all those who are recipients of a similar grace. With St. Paul, we all say, For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. I, I, this is Charlie Rich talking, remember. I have passed my 87th year, so where do we go from here? My bags are packed. They have been packed since the first day I became a Catholic. He's been dying for heaven since the first day he became a Catholic, and he's left on earth from the age of 33 to the age of 99. Since the first day I became a Catholic, I had only one thought. What am I doing in a world like this so far away from the homeland of my soul that heaven is? The gates of heaven having been opened up for me by my baptism, why stand outside like a prodigal son? I listen to the music from heaven ringing in my inner hearing. So I long to be where this music comes from, the angelic world where all the blessed souls now are. I think of all this, and as I do so, I find myself drawing near the goal of my heart's desire, Jesus, in the state of glory is. So I wonder, why am I being detained on this earth? But I realize God has his own reason for this kind of detention, so I say fiat. And with this word comes a piece of soul I would not exchange for all the wealth in the world. Still, in spite of the patience I have the grace to have from my having to be so far away, From the home of the soul, heaven is. I look forward to the day of the Lord when I shall get the grace to enter into the kingdom of heaven for which we pray when we say, Thy kingdom come. I think of all this, and as I do so, I call to mind the words in which the palmist says, Lead me forth from prison that I may give thanks to your name. Psalm 142. I too long to be set free from this prison of mortality so that with St. Paul I can be freed from this life and be with Christ. Okay? Okay, guys. So it's okay. It's okay to wish to be freed from this prison of mortality so that we can be with Christ. That is the state. I'm tempted to say that's the state of the Catholic on earth. Maybe it's the state of the Christian on earth. But look. We should be living, going through this life in the state of tension, okay? On the one hand, we wish we were dead because we have to be dead to be united with our beloved one in the way that we yearn. But on the other hand, get this. This is the selfish reason. The moment we die, the opportunity to gain merit for heaven is over. The moment we die... It's fixed. Our, our, our state of beatitude for all eternity is fixed. 
every moment that we are still on earth, every moment we're still in this prison, every moment we're still in this exile, has the ability to gain, you know, to drop another coin in our piggy bank for all eternity of bliss in heaven. Every moment, you know, even if it's just throwing up, you know, throwing up a, a Hail Mary, not a Hail Mary pass, but a Hail Mary full of grace. Or when we're cut off in traffic saying, you know, God, bless that soul and bring him to know you, whatever it is making an ass of yourself in a Zoom call with your Harvard Business School class, whatever it is. Every day, every hour has the possibility of doing something which will make our vessel of beatitude in heaven, you know, that much bigger, even if it's only a milliliter bigger or whatever, okay? So on the one hand, we should kind of wish to die so we could be united with God. And on the other hand, we should be happy to live because every hour that we live has the possibility of um, improving our eternity in heaven. Now, I will close this with a, um, a great line from uh, Charlie Rich um, that I was told just this week by my good friend Rhonda Chervin, who, who was a lifelong disciple of Charlie Rich. Um, so here's the story. I hope she doesn't mind me telling you the story. Um, she was Jewish. She is a Jewish convert. She's still alive. She's a very wonderful woman. She's written about 67, over 60 books. I think it's 66 books. Um, uh, you can find her on the internet. Her name is Rhonda, R-O-N-D-A, Chervin, C-H-E-R-V-I-N. Anyway, um, she was a convert through the Von Hildebrands, but that's another story. Anyway, she got to know Charlie Rich relatively early on and and drank the wisdom sitting at his feet, so to speak. And her husband was, uh, she married, um, uh, if I remember, she married after her conversion, but she married a Jewish man. And um, she very much looked forward to his conversion to the Catholic Church. And he did eventually uh, become Catholic. And, but he was a hard sell. So um, Rhonda is walking down the street in New York with uh, Charlie Rich and with her husband, whose name escapes me at the moment. So anyway, so she's walking down the street with Charlie Rich and her husband. And, you know, she, you know, she's consumed with a desire for Charlie Rich to sell her husband on becoming a Catholic. And so her husband... I, why am I not remembering his name? Marty comes to mind, but I'm not sure. I'm, I think it is Martin, actually. I'm going to call him Marty. Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. So uh, Marty says to Charlie, which is a Jews, right? So they're kind of in your face. Uh, he says to Charlie Rich, you know, you know, why should I become Catholic? And Rhonda is standing there thinking, oh, you know, Charlie Rich is going to pour forth this great spiritual wisdom about why Martin should become Catholic. And Charlie Rich just turns to him and says, because you get more, <laughs> because you get more, you get more, <laughs> you get more if you're Catholic, right? You get more of what counts. You get more of heaven. You get more of bliss in heaven. You also get more peace on earth, uh, inner peace, not necessarily outer peace, but you get more. You get more of what counts. You get more of what counts for all eternity. So that's why we should be happy we're Catholic. You know, think of that uh, Lower East Side uh, pushcart peddler. Let me pull up, the, pull up one of those pictures again. You know, I have a pushcart peddler. Um, okay, well, this is definitely, uh, I have lots of pushcart peddlers because it's all pushcart peddlers. Okay, so here you have a Lower East Side pushcart peddler or two, right? Okay, so in the voice of a New York Side pushcart peddler, why should we become Catholic? Why should we be Catholic? Because we get more. Why should we hope that other people become Catholic? Because they get more. So with those words of profound Jewish wisdom, I should probably, I should probably uh, let you guys go. So uh, let me just look um, at my notes, see if there are any other things that I had meant to say. Um, 
uh, I, I'll just these are just little afterthoughts. It's very beautiful to me to see how Charlie Life's Charlie Rich's life was actually the ideal Hasidic life, because Hasidic men actually are supposed to the only thing their life is all about prayer. It's not about work. It's not about anything else. So I think that's very beautiful that God gave Charlie Rich the Hasidic ideal of life, a life of nonstop prayer. Um, I will also say that when Charlie Rich said, um, uh, with this word comes a piece of soul I would not exchange for all the wealth in the world, I must admit, speaking as a uh, you know, former Harvard Business School I know I was at the top. I was in a class of 900 people at Harvard Business School, and I finished number two. Um, you know, my, what's that mean? Put me in the top fifth of a percent or something. I mean, I, I really, I won like every award um, for my year and so forth. And I was, of course, invited back to the faculty, which was actually something that was in itself kind of an award. And uh, yeah, there are times when um, I look at classmates of mine who have literally... At least one of them literally became a multi-billionaire. I think I've mentioned that before. And many of them have hundreds of millions of dollars. Many of them. <laughs> many of them. Yeah, I don't know what, 10% of them, 5% of them. I, and I had better grades than any of, any of them, I guarantee you. So sometimes in my, you know, glomer moments, I, you know, I'm kind of kicking myself a little bit maybe for turning my back on the career I could have had or envious. I'm certainly at times envious. And, um, and yet, all I have to do is remind myself of their situation and my situation. And I can earnestly say with Charlie there that I would not exchange my Harvard Business School career with any of those. And when I was in that Zoom reunion yesterday, with my uh, section mates, I looked around the screen, you know, row, 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 row. And um, I just felt sorry for them. I would not exchange. And some of them were talking about their wealth in one way or another, posting about their wealth. There's no way, there's no way I could bring myself to um, have the slightest, slightest, slightest whiff of uh, wishing that I was in their situation rather than mine. So anyway, uh, I hope that wasn't too self-serving. Um, anyway, thank you so much for watching. And I know this is one of the shorter ones, but um, I think that uh, I've gotten the point across for this show. I, I won't have a live show next week because of a family wedding. I, I I won't have it on. No, I won't have it on the weekend actually because of. Uh, so anyway, yeah, next weekend you have off, and um, uh, anyway, but I I hope to be back. I guess the 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 following Sunday, certainly the following weekend. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. You know what I'm gonna do? I have I haven't done this on other shows, but because it's a little early, you can tune out if you want. Um, but I'm going to actually f maybe flip through. Should I flip through the, the chats? Um, mm, nah, this, I mean, this is wonderful, and I look forward to reading them. But, um, but it doesn't look like anyone has a burning question for me. So anyway, um, thank you for watching. I hope you tune in again. Thank you for being the community you are. Uh, thank you for your prayers. Uh, thank you for giving me all of the, the joy that I get from doing these shows. And um, maybe not next Sunday, but I'll be back. And I have to say bye for now. And I'll uh, put back that, um, that, that music for now, at least. So uh, here we go. Whoops. I did my... Here we go. Whoops, that's not the right screen. Hmm.